few more people are going to trickle in. Uh, in person, uh, please make sure uh, you've signed in and taken a raffle, or if you can get a raffle after the presentation, we'll be giving away a smart plug and some LED Edison bolts. But thank you very much uh, for coming to today's uh, PISA. Uh, today's lecture is going to be on high-performance building design, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, but before we get into that, we're going to tell you a little bit about the IDL. Uh, we're dedicated to the education, outreach, and technical support of high-performance buildings in the inner mountain west. Uh, this is our team. We're still growing and looking to expand and hire. So if you know of any students interested in energy efficiency or net zero building and high-performance design, uh, please send them our way. Uh, we have a couple of different programs from our sponsor, uh, Idaho Power. Um, it's one of them is the Technical Design Assistance. Uh, so we provide technical design assistance uh, up to three phases uh, based off of scope of work. Uh, so anything less than $2,000. Um, so if you have a question about a software feature or an application or a code standard or something like that, you can give me a call or send me an email and I'll respond uh, as best as I can to assist you. Um, so that's pretty, you know, pretty quick turnaround, simple stuff. Uh, phase two is for two, four, four, two to $4,000. Um, so it's a little more, more complicated, a little more work being done. And so we have to have a scope of work for that. And then anything over $4,000 is a phase three. Um, there's a cost share associated with that, uh, with us paying 75% and the owner of the project having to pay the other 25%. Uh, that's a full project intake, in-depth analysis, detailed assistance and reporting um, to you. There we go. Uh, so in addition to the BSUC lecture series, we also have our Lunch and Learn lecture series. Uh, we do 20 sessions per year um, for two architects, engineers, and professional organizations. Uh, we come to you and we bring lunch and we teach you about emerging technologies, uh, standards, and software and uh, building uh, workflow methods. Uh, so uh, for example, tomorrow I'm hosting a, a luncheon and training session on new layer level lighting controls. Uh, we have a showcase demo room up in our office featuring uh, the, the new technology and fixtures, and so I lecture on that, and as well as demonstrate the feature uh, live, and you get to actually participate and play with the lights and get to understand the technology as well. So things like that. Uh, we also have our energy resource library. Uh, this is a collection of building diagnostic tools. We have over 900 of them. Uh, pretty much any kind of equipment in a building that uses electricity, uh, we have a tool to monitor or analyze and help you diagnose what's wrong with it. Uh, as well as if you're thinking about upgrading uh, you know, your HVAC system with a new fan, uh, coil, uh, pump, or something along those lines uh, uh, in that uh, regard. Uh, you can investigate and see the current performance uh, and see how well it will do. Uh, that's a free resource uh, just within Idaho Power Territory. Uh, you can go online, uh, create an account with us, and then you just kind of add tools to your shopping cart, uh, kind of like an Amazon thing. So we, we try to simplify and make it as easy as possible. Uh, it is free. Uh, you just have to have an account so we know who you are and where you're taking the tools. Uh, another one we have is our design uh, tools library. Uh, so these are a collection of tools to kind of help simplify and reduce uh, time barriers uh, for aspects of the design that would otherwise hinder uh, energy efficiency measures being used in the early design process. Um, right now we're working on the CBEX 2018 data visualization and micro master file. Uh, so that's kind of a Narrowing down the focus of CBEX just to Idaho and the Inner Mountain West to see how it applies specifically to our region and our climate and how it can uh, be best utilized by our country here. Uh, we'll be presenting that in the second half of the year. Um, so now I'd like to introduce um, our speakers uh, for the day. Uh, we have SSOE. Uh, we have David here, and I'm so sorry, I can't Sim remember. Sim Simri? Simra. Simra here. Uh, so Simra is from Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. She comes from us. And then uh, Toledo, Toledo, Ohio. 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 Uh, so David uh, is a unique breed in that he's a mechanical engineer and architect. So, you know, as, what did you put it earlier? You love pain? Yes. <laughs> uh, multiple choice exams. So, and then uh, Simra is uh, from India, but she's working out of Atlanta, Georgia. She's an architect. Uh, both of them kind of work in the industrial automotive uh, in, uh, sector of the field. And so uh, with a lot of industry kind of coming into Idaho and we're seeing a lot more warehouses and we kind of want to make sure that those buildings are efficient and that, you know, when they're going to be around a while, we want to make sure that, you know, we can actually maintain them and utilize them properly. Um, so I asked them to come speak on high performance warehouses. Uh, so we're very lucky to have them. And I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Dave.
Hello everyone and welcome to today's pre presentation on high performance building design. Um, as I, I didn't introduce that, I am Simran Bajaj, an architectural designer at SSO Review, and David is an architect and mechanical engineer. Today we have the opportunity to delve into the critical subjects of energy analysis and embodied carbon, two pivotal aspects of sustainable design and construction. Let me start off by introducing our company and what we do. SSOE is an architecture and engineering firm with over 17 office locations in North America, as well as offices in Mexico and India. We work with a variety of market sectors ranging from automotive manufacturing facilities, battery manufacturing, semiconductor, healthcare, K-12, education, to name a few. At SSOE, sustainable design is a top priority and is in fact a part of our workflow. We aim at buildings which have high performance and low impact. The Sustainable Design Committee at SSOE Groups works with project leaders to evaluate designs and maximize results while minimizing costs. We track our water, waste, and energy savings, and it is worth noting that we have over 74 million in cumulative savings from 2010 to 2022, resulting from our LEED project. Uh, we are currently engaged in several significant projects uh, with clients that have targeted to be carbon neutral. Um, in terms of expertise too, SSOE has um, accredited professionals in lead, well, energy managers and procurement. And SSOE has been a silver member with USGBC since 2002. Um, some of the projects that I would like to mention, um, these are two of our lead platinum projects. The first one that you see is the Volkswagen 1 million automotive production facility in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, we are very proud to say that it is the first and only LEED Platinum certified automotive assembly plant in the world. Uh, through our innovative design, SSOE was able to offer over 44 million in savings. The second project that you see is the NIEHS Net Zero Energy Warehouse and Distribution Center, the project that we will delve into today. It is a LEED Platinum certified project and also the first ever net zero energy building in the US Department of Health and Human Services. Using energy wow. modeling, SSOE was able to offer a savings of more than $12,000 per year. So today we take a deeper dive at this warehouse building content. This was a federal project which shared office and warehouse spaces between the EPA and NIEHS. The facility is around 25,000 square feet and it's located in Durham, North Carolina. The project is LEED Platinum certified under the LEED for New Construction version 2009. We were awarded a total of 85 points and the graphic there below shows a breakdown of the different LEED credits and points allocated. Our major focus was on the energy and atmosphere credits. So now I would like to call upon David to give us a comprehensive understanding of the energy analysis of the NIEHS warehouse and the net zero energy framework. Thank you, Simon. Um, which is quicker working. Uh, before we get started, how many architects do I have out here right now in the room? And how many engineers? Okay, so we're actually like 50 50. That's great. Um, so this is kind of like the building achieved uh, a lot of these energy goals as well as a net zero energy um, back in 2016. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about um, how the building achieved that as a warehouse and office kind of combined program, as well as um, we're kind of having fun with comparing and contrasting the actual lead documentation with some of the energy simulation programs that we're using today. Um, so we're having a little bit of fun with that. Um, before I dive into that, though, the, the net zero energy design strategy um, is to basically try to get engaged early on. Um, there's nothing worse than a, a sudden sustainability agenda appearing in the middle of a project and now you have to figure out what to do. Um, so getting out in front is a, is a, a great strategy. Um, and then you're going to address generally the building envelope as well as the mechanical systems are kind of where the biggest bang for your buck in terms of address. <coughs> How to approach a, uh, a better energy performance, um, optimize use, monitor energy consumption, um, identify opportunities for additional improvement uh, in energy management, how we're going to use the building. Um, and then a note about on site renewable energy generation, which is generally the path that we're taking to get to net zero, offsetting the energy that we're using with the energy that we're producing um, through various strategies. You're going to see a solar panel strategy um, in the case of this building. 
Um, and then energy storage is just a matter of taking the energy we're producing and any excess, kind of giving that back in some way um, so that it, it can be used by the grid or, um, you know, whatever, whatever users could, could also benefit. So here is a nice little graphic of the building and the envelope. This is a combined program. Um, it is partially office, partially a warehouse. Um, and one of the constraints for the warehouse was it, it had to be kind of a secured uh, facility, which is part of the reason why you're gonna see in a moment that we ended up using uh, concrete. Um, I also mentioned that this project was handed to us after the schematic design phase. So a lot of these decisions had kind of already been thought about by the time we got on the project, um, but it was our task to kind of complete the thought process, do the documentation, achieve the goals of the project. Uh, we start by establishing a baseline. This is kind of the lead process. Um, we're gonna establish an energy baseline and then we're going to do a uh, comparison to a proposed building. Um, this is the baseline. The office, we've got R20 insulation on metal deck, exterior walls, R13, uh, windows were uh, U.5, no skylights in the office. Um, and then a point I wanna make here too is that the office was considered a conditioned space, whereas the warehouse building was considered a semi-heated space. Um, if you're unfamiliar with that, that means that the warehouse used was only heated and ventilated. Um, so there was no actual mechanical cooling in the warehouse. Um, and the semi-heated designation comes from using a low enough energy, um, low enough designed energy, not, not energy use, but actual maximum designed energy low enough that uh, we could qualify as a semi-heated space. And that's straight out of the energy code. The requirements for a semi-heated space were much lower in, um, in the ASHRAE standard that was used. Uh, R5 insulation as compared with R20, um, R13 cavity versus having to have 13 continuous and R7.5 um, windows and skylight values as well. To compare, I'll show you the office proposed that we ended up going with. So upgrading the 20 to 30, um, upgrading the 13 to uh, 21. So you'll see various upgrades to the envelope um, that were done here. I'll also point out that um, the roof insulation was significantly increased compared to the walls, which were also increased, but not quite by the same um, factor. Uh, we also were able to improve the performance of the warehouse um, going from R5 to R15, um, R13 to R15. Um, and as I mentioned, we ended up using a precast concrete sandwich panel to provide um, a little bit of extra security and, uh, and, and still get the insulating value for the continuous insulation. We also use cow wall windows um, and large skylights that you can kind of see appearing on, on the uh, loading dock portion of the warehouse. There's also skylights like that on the other portion of the warehouse. Um, so the two simulation programs, I'll, I'll call it, uh, the, the, lead, the program that was used for the lead documentation was simply train trace 700, which if you're unfamiliar, is a lot of manual data entry into a database um, for it to crank out the result. Um, it generates all kinds, it generates based on the inputs, all kinds of schedules and library values and things. And it's pretty, pretty intense in terms of uh, data entry. And you have to kind of know quite a bit about the building in order to fill in all of the blanks and have it generate these results. Um, so it's, it's pretty cumbersome um, and it's sort of more geared towards documentation, not, ex not necessarily experimentation. Um, and then the program that I'm going to kind of contrast with that that you're going to see most of is this program code tool um, that is a more recent development in the uh, energy simulation world. Uh, it, it's a, to me, it's a high level energy modeling software you can use pretty early on in your design when you're just developing concepts um, and kind of can give you a, a flavor of the different moves you're making and, and what's happening. I'll make a quick, quick note about energy simulation that I'm sure we're all super familiar with, and that is that you are a human, and um, you know you will you will get information out of the software. The more you know, the more you can kind of trust that information. Um, but be sure when you get this information back that you're kind of checking that, benchmarking it against other projects. Um, you know, it's the the computer does an amazing job calculating things. Um, but as humans, we have to interpret results and, and decide whether or not we trust things and how they compare. And, uh, so that's enough of that. Um, so now I'll get into some of the inputs for this kind of early on code tool modeling type software. Um, this is the building geometry. So this building geometry was actually exported from a Revit model. Um, the geometry is kind of carved up into different categories and then exported imported into the uh, Cove uh, 
online platform, and uh, and then it can kind of run various uh, 3D analyses like daylighting, and, um, radiation, sun hours, things of that nature, um, which I'm not going to dive too far into. But the the software actually generates a context map, um, which is pretty neat. You can you can kind of manipulate that a little bit if needed. For example, since this building was already built by the time we were conducting this kind of um, simulation, this building actually appeared in the context map and I had to hide the actual building so I could put my model of the building on top of the building, which was kind of fun. Um, <laughs> so there it is in context. It pulls all the values from the actual location. Um, so it's pretty neat. And I will mention also that it, the software with very little input, and this is one of the cool things about the upfront, with very little input, it generates all of this stuff automatically for you to see. Um, so depending on how well you know the projects, um, how well you know the codes you're using, you can kind of, you're free to sort of play with these values if you are if you know how to do it intelligently, or you can kind of take it at face value and run with it. Um, it does a fairly decent job of doing that. Um, I'll just mention, I'm, I'm going to kind of use this to sort of highlight some important things about this building in general, but also to kind of expose you to the code tool interface if you haven't seen it before. Um, so the initial thermal values are going to be taken from whatever ASH rate code you pick um, or IECC equivalent. Um, and then you can modify the values for your design strategies, kind of generate a baseline model, compare it to some things you want to do. Um, in our case, the warehouse was semi-heated. So you'll see that the values um, for the warehouse are, are quite a bit lower. And this is, by the way, the proposed design, not the energy baseline. Um, but you'll see also that the tool likes to put these little traffic light boxes to tell you whether the, the, the things you're picking are a good idea or maybe not so great performance-wise. So what's interesting here is like, again, being a, a human interpreting what's going on here, the warehouse is semi-heated. So it's telling me, wow, that's, that's really not a whole lot of insulation, but I know that I'm gonna get paid back when I tell it what the thermostat set points are because it's only semi-heated. My set points are gonna be a lot higher. I'm gonna allow it to get a lot warmer in there. Um, and there's no mechanical cooling. And here we get into some of the usage and schedule information. So it will generate, and, and you'll see this in the next few slides, it will generate the schedule automatically based on the type of building that you told it that it is. Um, you're free to tweak that. And you can see there's occupancy lighting and equipment schedules. Um, it will do watts per square foot based on tabular values. You can also look that up manipulated. Um, there's a few other schedules that it will do also. Uh, equipment schedule, similar thing. Um, it can pull equipment watts per square foot um, based on tabular values. I will note that this value of 0 0.1 watts per square foot seems really low to me for an equipment value. Um, that is what uh, is being condoned as the warehouse uh, equipment receptacle power density. But um, you know, if you've got any kind of charging, vehicle charging or anything in your warehouse, that value is probably way too low. So just a kind of a note of concern for uh, warehouse design. Um, next here, the occupancy schedule, um, similar to the other schedules that will generate automatically. Um, it tends to use the occupants per square foot numbers, tabular values that in our experience ends up generating a whole lot of occupants. Um, for example, this one said there were 70 people in the warehouse. There's probably like three in there at any given time. Um, and, and that was kind of agreed with what I saw in the lead documentation. Um, we're gonna assume there's 10 this model and the schedule was generated automatically. Um, HVAC set points. Uh, so one note of caution about HVAC set points is make sure that you kind of know about what you're doing when adjusting these and trying to get some kind of energy benefit. Because if you're thinking about, you know, actual modeling of what may occur in this building, if you're assuming that people are going to be comfortable being warmer and not using the mechanical cooling, that may not be the best assumption to go on. If you really want to dive deep into it, there is an actuary standard 55 that can be applied to kind of um, develop a different set point. But in general, these set points tend to be pretty good um, and are standard set points. This is where I talked about getting paid back on the uh, on the semi-heated space because we're going to, I know because it's semi-heated that my set points are going to be a lot higher, um, a lot higher in the summer and a lot lower in the winter. So we can adjust those based on how the semi-heated space was conceived. And CodeTool likes it, got a lot of green boxes. So um, that's sort of how that plays out <coughs> in the semi-heated space. 
building systems. There's a lot of things you can do here if you um, are, are familiar with some of these and, and want to adjust them. Uh, I'll mention the, the warehouse was a single zone, heated and ventilated, um, which was the same system that was proposed in, uh, in the ASHRAE standard. The office was a dedicated outdoor area with a BRF system, um, which was maybe a little bit better than the, uh, the uh, system that was proposed in the ASHRAE or in the, in the lead baseline. Um, the, the values of the performance coefficients and everything are going to be generated automatically based on the systems you pick. Um, again, the, the software is trying to kind of make assumptions based on what you pick. And then you can, of course, adjust them later if you know better um, or you just want to try some different things. Uh, it's going to assume the ventilation rates from the standards. And again, you know, you've got an office, maybe it's got some conference rooms, maybe it's an open office. You know, if you know the standards and the tabular values, there's different values for those uh, for conference room versus office, how much ventilation is required. What the software will try to do is attempt to generate kind of an average value. Um, so you may have to do a little bit of additional math if you want that to be like super accurate. Again, I go back to this is a high level modeling tool. It's not uh, grinding out the details of a project that's almost complete and trying to document it necessarily. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, it does rely quite a bit on some of the weighted averages. Um, so if you want to get a little sharper on that, you have to do some math on your own. Um, and then I'm going to mention this quickly about the warehouse. Um, we were able to justify the hot water demand being zero because the warehouse was next to an office which had the restrooms. Um, and the only actual hot water demand in the warehouse was a safety shower. So we can attribute a value of zero because the safety shower obviously is only going to be used in an emergency and it had an instantaneous heater. So in general, on a per year basis, the safety shower is not going to use any hot water. Um, and then just a quick note, uh, this, is, this is the page where we tell it we're using mainly natural gas. And hey, by the way, it's not an office, it's actually a warehouse because the program wants you to tell it what the building is based on like five or six categories, and then you have to do some further refinement to say it's a warehouse, it's actually not an office. But it will use that input to generate schedules and things of that nature. So you have to kind of start somewhere. Um, I'm gonna mention a metric that's really important in the energy modeling world that you're maybe familiar with, uh, energy use intensity or EUI. And it's basically um, typically measured in KBTU per square foot per year. So it is a metric that is um, averaged over a year span. So it can tell you rough energy usage, BTU being energy usage per year. And then it's per square foot, which is important to note because that means you can compare buildings of various size with this metric without having to do additional math. So you can say that million square foot office, oh, that's really big, uh, has the same EUI as this 30,000 square foot office. Um, and they can be comparable in that sense if that happens to be the case. Uh, I'll mention also that um, oh, this metric is used uh, by the AIA 2030 challenge, which is a kind of net zero out uh, energy approaching challenge, um, which attempts to benchmark uh, building energy usage by type and try to lower that. Um, and, the, and the output will actually generate, and the codes will actually generate a comparison with the AIA 2030 goals. So, this is what an output page looks like for the baseline. Um, and I'm going to kind of compare the lead energy model, which was done in train trace with the code tool model, um, and kind of give you the results here. So what I had to do was take the building square footage that was submitted for the lead documentation and divide this value, which was just in BTU per square foot, or just in BTU per year, by the square footage to get a number that I can compare with the UI. Um, so this is where I wind up on the UI of both of those. And you can see they're fairly comparable. Um, the only thing I will mention is that this further breaks down the EUI into cooling, heating, lighting, equipment, fans, pumps, hot water. Uh, Lee does the same thing. Categories don't quite line up perfectly. Um, and I think there's an interesting thing going on in this result with the heating uh, appearing super high. Um, and the only thing I can think of why that shows up like that is probably because the warehouse square footage is so much bigger than the office. It's only heated. The office is the only cool space. Um, so I think it, it dropped the cooling really low um, compared to the trace model. Uh, this is the breakdown comparison. So you can see that I tried to kind of make an equivalency between the coke tool categories and the train trace categories. Um, 
And, and again, I, I think there's something funny going on here with the electric load for heating, because like I mentioned, we're using a VRF system. Um, I, I don't necessarily believe that the heating was zero, um, even though it was documented that way. But interestingly enough, we do come up with a, a you know, UI that's sort of in the ballpark of the same. Um, whether one program did a good job and one program didn't, um, you know, that, that's definitely a topic for further investigation. Uh, and then I'll compare the proposed system. So the, the train trace model, the baseline, and this was the actual submitted documentation for the platinum. The baseline was 36.8, um, and I did that by dividing square footage again. And the proposed was 27.94. So you're seeing a pretty good almost 10 point reduction in the UI. Um, and we saw a similar reduction when some of the levers were pulled on the Cove model um, to try and compare the baseline with the with the with the proposed UI. So it feels like things are relatively comparable, um, but this one obviously achieved with a lot less effort. Could be done in an earlier design stage. This one, lots of effort, later design stage, prepared for documentation. So um, it, it's nice to see that result, um, even though it maybe doesn't break down quite <laughs> how you would expect. So this is just the comparison of the breakdown. I'm not going to belabor that too much. Um, and then I mentioned reaching, reaching net zero through the use of energy generation. This was the, um, you know, obviously the building achieved net zero in our documentation. This was the documentation, uh, th this was the attempt of uh, a rough guess at the solar panel square footage. There's some inputs and it's, it generates an EUI um, based on the offsetting of the solar panels. And it really does a great job. Um, According to this result of lowering the EUI, we end up with a net EUI of negative 10.07. So that's telling me that we're actually generating enough energy to give it back to the grid. Um, so <coughs> pretty amazing um, that that you know solar panels um, of roughly the area that we calculated are are proposing uh, a, a pretty incredible drop in EUI. This is the potential reduction in EUI over here on the side, it added another column. So <laughs> you get a reduction of almost equivalent to the original baseline requirement of the building. So that's pretty incredible. Um, whether you believe that or not, uh, again, I think you get what you give. So if you understand your solar panels really well, you may be able to generate a result that seems right to you or not. I am not very experienced in solar panel design, so this was my attempt at replicating it. Um, and then this is the last slide I'm going to talk about. The program, and I didn't get too far into this, but the program is capable of generating multiple alternatives in, a, in attempts to suggest optimized designs for your building. Um, so what this kind of spaghetti diagram is trying to do is each line is a um, each line is a lever that you're pulling more or less. It's a it's a variable, and you'll see kind of like uh, Slashes on uh, marker points on each line. Those are each of the variables that it, each of the values that it's actually plugging in for each variable. And so each blue line is a scenario. Um, and you can actually draw windows in this thing and tell it, like, hey, I, I only want to look at payback years that are less than 10, and it will eliminate the, the spaghetti lines that, that don't qualify and kind of suggest, like, this one down here is, is a bundle, a scenario um, that it's suggesting is optimized for. Uh, energy. Um, I ran this thing having already done the lead uh, proposed. So there's not a whole lot of wiggle room in terms of coming up with a better scenario than a lead platinum at net zero. But it did generate this one just for, for uh, example. Uh, it's telling me that uh, in 18 and a half payback years, uh, I can generate a 57% energy saving by following this bundle, which all of the set points are, are set up here. So can kind of go through that um, using the optimization. And another thing that was recently added to code that I haven't had a chance to mess with, but that would be neat to see is they added the ability to create your own construction material types. Um, so you can define R values, um, frequencies, things of that nature, and actually run the scenarios with materials that you're intending to use that you're familiar with. Um, it takes a little bit more setup, uh, but we can kind of dive a little deeper into that. You want to. So with that, I think 
going to hand it <coughs> back to Simran and she's going to talk about legislative analysis covered. Thank you. Thanks, David. So now we'll be like shifting our focus to embody carbon and carbon footprint. Um, when we talk about carbon footprint, two terms come to mind. One is operational energy and the other is embodied carbon. Uh, operational energy is basically the energy that is associated during the service life of the building, such as lighting, HVAC, power. And this contributes to 72% of buildings carbon footprint. Whereas embodied carbon uh, refers to emissions associated during the use of the product and the service, um, which approximates to 28% of the building's carbon footprint. So here we'll be looking at how to reduce our embodied carbon through life cycle analysis. Um, the diagram that you see is the focus areas on reducing uh, embodied carbon. You start off in a broader perspective by building light um, and then look into material efficiencies and reuse, that is the layers of the building. Um, and then building low carbon, building for the future, which is adaptable and durable design. And finally, carbon offsets. Um, so now we'll be looking at life cycle analysis and the simulation program that we use for this is OneClick LCA. OneClick LCA, it is an automated life cycle assessment software that helps you calculate and reduce environmental impacts associated with all stages of building life cycle. And it is a tool that helps uh, architects and designers compare design options, optimize carbon and circularity throughout the process, and basically helps us choose more sustainable building materials. The software gives you outputs about uh, which particular building system is contributing most to the embodied carbon, and we'll go into that in the next slides. A little bit about their database, the software has over 150,000 plus data points that undergo a very rigid 10-point verification process. And they integrate environmental product declarations from all available platforms that are manufacturer specific, industry standard, as well as they have a local compensation strategy uh, to localize the data. Uh, for those of you do who don't know, an environmental product declaration, it's, it's a document that transparently reports objective, comparable third party verified data uh, from a life cycle perspective. And you can read more about the database uh, on, uh, in their uh, website. For purposes of LEED, um, so as I said, the building net zero, the 110 building net zero energy warehouse was done in version 2009 and it was certified as platinum in version 2009. That version of LEED did not examine embodied carbon. But now, with the introduction of the MR building life cycle impact reduction credits from the LEED version 4, uh, we designers are encouraged to analyze the environmental impacts of all stages of a building's life cycle. Uh, this is just a quick breakdown of what the credit entails. Uh, for gaining one point, you have to conduct a life cycle analysis. For two points, we demonstrate a minimum of 5% reduction in three out of the six impact categories uh, that I will be talking about in, when I move into the software. For three points, you demonstrate a 10% reduction. And for four points, we demonstrate a 10% reduction, but also incorporate, incorporate reuse and salvage materials. So this software tool integrates with Revit and uh, it provides one of the largest construction material database. So we decided to utilize this software to analyze the embodied carbon and environmental impacts of this facility. Therefore, we are trying to gain insight into which building systems have the greatest impacts and which areas we should focus on optimization. And our focus will be limited to the building structure and envelope when we run the analysis, because that is what the lead requirement is. However, you can conduct a life cycle analysis for uh, the entire building, just depends on what your scope is for the analysis. So um, this is a quick step-by-step -step, uh, way to use the software. So you initially set up the software uh, in cloud. You, you input the floor area, the number of floors, the frame type, and the certification you're, you're trying to pursue. Um, this tool um, is a snip from the Revit plugin. You start by reviewing the settings, the database, scope of the model, and um, move on to defining which models you actually want to input into the software. Because as we know, our Revit models have a lot of linked files, and we have the electrical model, the mechanical, structural, and we don't need all that for a life cycle analysis. So in the Revit plugin itself, you get to filter out which elements you want to take into the cloud for analysis. And after that, um, in the detailed scope category, you edit and filter out how you want to move the elements. 
if you want them to be as whole units or you want to split them into layers and surfaces. And uh, like, for example, the roof, we, we do want to analyze the different layers of the roof. But when it comes to the doors and the windows, we, we are able to put in the entire unit because there is an environmental product declaration by manufacturers for their doors and their windows and such. And then you can use the materials category to understand. So the software lets you um, highlight a material and then it shows you in Revit which particular element it's referring to. So you can really filter out all the unwanted data that you want to push into the cloud. And finally, once you're done, depends on which license you have, you can either conduct the analysis in Revit or push it to cloud. So we, after this step, move the uh, input into cloud. And on the software page, we first start off by mapping like the project to the Revit model, and then classifying elements and filtering the imported data. Um, next, we move on to combining the data. Basically, all the beams get combined as a beam of structures and all the columns. So we're basically trying to combine the data so we have less to work with once we move on. And uh, finally, you're mapping the material to the appropriate EPD. So in this stage, you sort of map it to the exact manufacturer that you have used. If you have a manufacturer specific EPD, or if you just wanted to create a baseline case using industrial standard uh, wall panels, industrial standard roofing insulation, you can map it over here. Uh, and I must tell you that you can change the mappings once your software has input all the data and run the analysis, you are always able to uh, change the mapping to check which options are better. And finally, once we have completed all these process, we uh, let the software run the analysis. And basically for the NIH building, um, this is sort of like um, the result that we got. We see that it has a thousand, uh, close to 1,600 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions from the project scope that we calculated. And the software sort of benchmarks where your building stands with other projects of comparable size, uh, similar material, and in the same location or like similar location. And it gives you a value of the embodied carbon benchmark. And as you can see, we're not, we're not doing so good. Um, uh, we're, we're standing at 693, which is lower on the embodied carbon benchmarking scale. And the software also gives you the results uh, sh showing which areas you're supposed to focus. So in the 30% bridging documents that we received for this project, most of the uh, materials and the building assembly selections were already being made. And they decided to go with concrete, precast concrete wall panels. And as you can see, that's not good for um, the, if you're trying to reduce our carbon footprint. And that's what the software tells us as well, that your concrete wall elements are a high contribution factor. Um, and so on, like the ready mix concrete for foundation, aluminum, PIR insulation. And on this results page, you get to decide which element, if I make a change, will have a maximum impact in reducing my carbon footprint. So the software lets you optimize your design by giving you an open material comparison and selection. Um, this was a, a comparison for the insulation, roof insulation panels. And as you can see, uh, I have compared PUR versus XPS versus PIR and high density mineral wool insulation. And it gives me a global warming potential uh, value. That is basically the, 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 the unit that I see to decide which would be a better performing material in terms of uh, global warming potential. And I conducted several tests on that. Like we tested a TPO roofing membrane instead of the EPDM. And these are the six impact categories that I was talking about. Um, as you can see, like changing it to a TPO roof, it helped a little bit in non-renewable energy and the value of the carbon dioxide, um, sorry, the embodied carbon benchmarking went up a little, but not as much. So then we tested uh, with PVC roofing instead of EPDM. It has a good uh, reduction in eutrophication, but the other impact category is not as much. Um, then we tested mineral wool roof insulation instead of PIR insulation boards. Again, it's performing better than using a PIR insulation board for this project. Uh, and finally, testing the insulated metal wall panels of the warehouse design instead of the precast concrete panels. And here is where we see a very large impact in terms of all the impact categories, the ozone depletion potential almost went down to like zero. So we kind of understand that, okay, using metal wall panels in the market that we have today 
work better than using the concrete wall element. So this software helps you test out different materials and sort of choose the best strategy in terms of carbon emissions. Um, yes, a lot of cost factors do you have to keep in mind. And um, as of now, we have not gone into the cost aspect in this uh, analysis, but it's a very good tool in the initial stage of design when you're having your um, design sheds to decide what the building is going to be. And after combining all the different uh, optimization strategies, like I changed the wall panels from precast concrete to uh, insulated metal wall panels, the roof membrane from PPDM to PPO, and the roof insulation boards from PIR to heavy density mineral wool. And we can see that we're able to reduce the carbon dioxide equivalent emissions by almost uh, 50%. And um, it, it is a more like optimized case of the, and, and we're doing well even in terms of the carbon heroes benchmark in terms of the industry, uh, other buildings that are in the market today. So we as a company, we're trying to use this software and most of our projects trying to incorporate this in our workflow, at least in the initial phases of design. So we make better and more informed decisions. Um, with the AIA 2030, although embodied carbon results do not directly uh, contribute to your EUI reduction targets, AIA does encourage tracking your carbon as part of your uh, climate action goals. So in the 2030 reporting uh, DDX, they do have this tab for you to uh, input the life cycle analysis result if you have conducted one. Um, and the one-click LCA tool that we use is an accepted carbon modeling tool. Um, I would like to end by this uh, snippet from the EIA 2030 challenge, which is that annually the embodied carbon of a building is responsible for 11% of the global greenhouse gas emissions, and it's connected to issues of public health and equity. So eliminating these emissions is key to addressing climate change. With a deeper understanding of energy analysis and embodied carbon, we unlock the potential to create more sustainable as well as environmentally conscious design. Uh, thank you all for joining us today, and I would now like to open the floor to any questions, comments, or feedback that you may have. Just from a practical standpoint, how expensive is the code to, to integrate into your workflow? Um, I don't know the actual uh, cost of the subscription. Um, we have a company subscription, and uh, basically anybody throughout our entire company uh, is able to use it just with their email. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the cost of it is, but it is, it is a subscription type of service. Any questions online? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself, start talking, or you can type it in the chat. No? Okay. Any more? in-person questions. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, for